Oh, uh, okay. We have started recording. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, welcome to this week's uh, AI seminar at ISI again. So today we are very happy to have Professor Alex Boy from UCLA, uh, the medical school. Uh, so Dr. Boy received his PhD in computer science in uh, the year of 2000. Upon uh, so he's the he has many leadership roles at UCLA, where uh, among which he's the director of the medical and imaging informatics group. Uh, and the host also hosts the uh, David Gaffin Chair in Informatics. He's also the Senior Associate Director for Informatics uh, at UCLA's Clinical and Translational Science Institute, and also Associate Director for Medical Informatics at the Institute of Precision Health, and also uh, Co-Director of the Center for Smart Health. So Dr. Boyce's research includes informatics and data science for biomedical research and healthcare in areas related to distributed information architectures and uh, uh, mHealth, and also development, evaluation, and the translation of AI-based methods, uh, such as machine learning and reinforcement learning for healthcare, and uh, clinical data visualization. Uh, so his work bridges comp contemporary uh, computational approaches with opportunities arising from the breadth of biomedical observations and the electronic health record, uh, tackling the associated transla uh, translational challenges. So I think uh, many of us already know uh, Professor Alex Boy, including myself, which we, uh, so uh, among which we had different uh, kinds of collaborations with him. So today, uh, Professor Boy is going to talk about uh, the topic of uh, learning from data and the lessons learned. Um, towards individually tailored healthcare. Yeah, let's welcome Professor Boy to start his talk. Thanks, Yihao. Um, it's, it's wonderful being here, and it's good to see some of you again. And um, I'll try and keep an eye on the Q&A um, chat box, but if not, uh, feel uh, Muha will, will certainly um, interrupt me. Feel free to ask questions as, as we go along, or um, we can answer questions at, at the very end. But um, what I wanted to do today is sort of give you a sort of 30,000 foot view in terms of AI within healthcare and some of the challenges that, that we've seen um, in terms of implementation. And I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail. If we want to go into technical detail, I'm happy to answer some more specific questions. But what I wanted to do was engage um, in a discussion really about the challenges of, of applying a lot of computational and data-driven techniques into medicine. So I think many of you are aware of this, um, but biomedical research and clinical care are generating an, really an unprecedented amount of data. And when we look at the amount of information that, that's actually generated simply from patient care, um, the last estimate I saw was that in 2020, we actually had generated 2.3 zettabytes of data just from clinical enterprise. So this is actually excluding um, the, the, the significant amount of, of data that's actually generated for biomedical research, which is even probably another, um, well, several, again, uh, several zettabytes worth of data. Um, so simply from patient care, as patients are being seen um, in the hospitals, as, as you go into uh, different environments, that's a lot of data. And obviously this, there's a lot of different types of data. Um, obviously, this has actually been accelerated by the use of electronic health records. Within the past 15 years, we've obviously seen this huge uptake in terms of electronic health records, and that's obviously created a lot of um, data that we can actually begin to mine and look at. Moreover, a lot of this data is now longitudinal, right? So now we have to have observations about these patients over time. And certainly from the research side and moving into the clinical side, we actually also have these new types of observations. We have sort of these multi-omic type of in, um, uh, observations, whether we're thinking about genomics or proteomics or, or metabolomics or, or choose your favorite other type of omics. Um, we have obviously new types of imaging that are always uh, becoming present. Um, and so a lot of this information is really also enabling these novel insights about disease and the human condition. Lastly, we also have new digital platforms that are really providing information outside of the traditional clinical setting, right? So now we have things like mobile health or M health, where we're actually collecting a lot of information. For those of you with smartphones or, or smart, smart watches, obviously there's a lot of um, motion type of information that's collected there. If you have Fitbit, more specific activity, 
um, exercise type of, of information. We have things like patient portals now that are also generating information and um, patient reported outcomes or pros. So with all of this information, obviously there's a large amount of, of healthcare data and um, also biomedical research data. And it's really renewed a lot of interest in applying AI-based methods within um, healthcare and the clinical environment. So obviously there's a lot of different components to AI. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna sort of touch upon two different aspects um, within this talk. Obviously there are multiple other ones. Um, so within machine learning, obviously we've got um, the, the ability for detection and classification of tasks. We have reinforcement learning, which is really aimed at optimizing selections to reach the goal over time. Um, obviously there's a lot of work done in natural language processing and NLP and other sorts of components of AI that are also applicable to healthcare. But as we look at um, how machine learning and reinforcement learning are applicable within um, the clinical environment, these are sort of some of the, the traditional or conventional tasks that you might think of in how ML or, or RL are being applied. For machine learning, for instance, we're thinking about um, tasks related to disease detection. Uh, we might be also thinking about computational phenotyping um, and then risk stratification. How do we know if a patient has cancer? Um, is the risk for their cancer high? In terms of reinforcement learning, which is a little bit different, obviously, for them, um, we can think about its application in terms of clinical decision support. How do we optimize what is going to be the next diagnostic test um, in order to figure out what's wrong with the patient? How do we choose what is the next intervention um, that is going to maximize some type of benefit for the individual? Um, and then obviously, outside of just direct patient care, you can think about reinforcement learning in terms of, of issues around workflow optimization, right? If you have, have a large hospital or healthcare enterprise, how do you actually um, ensure that a lot of different components are actually um, working together in, in sort of a, a good flow? So with that, obviously, there's a lot of opportunities to better tailor health and healthcare delivery through these data-driven methods. Uh, we can think about, for instance, the deeper characterization of at-risk populations through these computational phenotypes that are occurring. There's a lot of work right now going on in terms of being able to mine the electronic health record to better find or to better define um, different types of, of phenotypes, right? So rather than sort of having a one-size-fits-all approach to being able to diagnose someone or being able to look at someone in terms of um, specific codes or diagnoses, can we do a better job of identifying how an individual may um, be presenting in terms of different symptoms and different types of data? Um, obviously, there's, there's ML and RL approaches for earlier detection of disease and conditions, okay? Um, so you can imagine that we want to be able to use this, for instance, again, um, in cancer, that, that's an obvious sort of application. And collectively, all of these are sort of operationalizing precision medicine. What we want to be able to do is be able to use machine learning, reinforcement learning, and all the, the whole host of AI-based techniques um, in these real-world populations to maximize individual health outcomes, right? Precision health and precision medicine is sort of the, the holy grail today of being able to sort of go from um, the previous practice in medicine of we have clinical guidelines, we look at, at large populations, and this is how we think you fit into the population, um, to actually figuring out what is the best route for an individual um, over time and how do we best optimize their health. So these ideas are not new. AI in medicine um, has been around for some time. And for those of you who followed this space, you've, you've obviously heard about IBM Watson. Um, and IBM got into this space really, really early. Um, you can sort of think about it in terms of, of how IBM Watson has, has evolved in, in this article, for instance, in the New York Times from 2016, sort of um, was, was advocating um, how good Watson could be for healthcare, right? And again, this, this is sort of 2016, sort of about uh, almost six years out from this now. And there was a lot of fanfare about this, as you can imagine. Of course, in 2017, for those of you who were following Watson in this space, um, there was this report that basically said, no, it's not working, right? So um, IBM pitched, it's Watson supercomputers, the revolution in cancer care, it's nowhere close. There were um, various different difficulties as to the implementation of IBM Watson to, to address um, medicine particularly cancer care in, in places like MD Anderson and um, 
uh, Sloan Kettering. And then finally, um, I guess just this past year, um, there were rumors that IBM was going to sell off different components of IBM Watson Health simply because it was not making um, the money that, that they thought it would. So this sort of goes along the trajectory that we see almost every 20 years where there's this cycle of industry getting really excited about the applications of AI in healthcare. And everyone sort of jumps into this. We've seen uh, Google Health do this. We've seen Microsoft do this. We've seen um, a lot of the other big companies jump into this. And we sort of see that there's that they dump a lot of resources into it uh, for a few years and then and then the interest wanes up, wanes. And so that sort of begs the question, why is it so hard to translate AI, AI methods into healthcare, right? If, if this was an easy problem, they would have solved, someone would have solved it by now. Obviously there's a lot of challenges in terms of looking at um, why it's, it's difficult to deal with healthcare. So um, I'll offer a few thoughts and, and obviously there's a lot of different other aspects as to why it's, it's difficult to translate AI methods into healthcare. Um, the first one is that really medicine itself is an imprecise um, area. A lot of the observations that we have are fuzzy. Um, they're, not, they're not like the stock market where we actually have definitive numbers at the end of the day and we have a pretty good understanding of um, what's happening. Um, there might be a lot of confounders in, in sort of the business world and, that, and sort of the economic sort of uh, uh, forecasting that you might do for the stock market, but we still know that, for instance, at the end of the day, when the Dow Jones has a closing number, that closing number is definitive. There's nothing fuzzy about it. That's not quite true in medicine, um, where we have things like labs, we have a lot of subjective observations, whether it's from radiologists or pathologists, um, other people sort of making sort of indications, um, the symptoms themselves are, are sort of loose in terms of definitions. So medicine is imprecise. I, I would also argue that one of the challenges in medicine is that the frequency of the observations is also um, difficult. So rather than sort of looking at um, the stock market where you have clear measurements, for instance, every single day, it's a time series. Um, in medicine, in, the clin in clinical care, we do not actually have fixed frequency observations. They're, it's very rare for us to be able to have that type of information unless a patient, for instance, um, is in an ICU or intensive care. Um, most of the observations that we get are very sparse. So this actually complicates things. The other aspect of, of why medicine is, is sort of difficult in this particular first point is the scientific knowledge about disease changes very rapidly. So again, even though we have the stock market and their out, outside influences, we understand what those influences might be. Within the practice of medicine and clinical care, even within the span of five years, there may be significant changes in practice or policy that are going to affect how the data is, is shaped. The second sort of huge issue, I think, in terms of how translating AI methods into healthcare is problematic is uh, and this is somewhat similar to other industries, like many sensitive systems, there's very little tolerance for error. And when you actually get right down to it, uh, when, when, when some of these decisions, if you will, are related to a patient's life, um, you obviously do not want a lot of error, <laughs> right? Um, you, you want to take a very conservative approach. And so um, the error tolerance in terms of clinical decision support and these types of things is, is problematic. And now, while we might involve a physician or a clinician in the process at the end of the day to make a decision, um, if the inputs or, or the insights that an AI method is giving to a clinician um, is wrong and they're basing it on that, then there, there's potential for problems, right? And the last point, and that sort of picks up on, on what I just said, is that healthcare involves many sociotech technical issues, right? There are ethical issues, there are various sort of adoption issues, and there are challenges, and healthcare has always been one of the lagging areas in terms of technology and adoption, and we're seeing that also in this case with AI. So going off of that first point, though, and thinking about it a little bit more, we have to also realize that disease is a complex phenomenon that we observe in many ways. 
And within healthcare and within the electronic health record and, and patient care, we observe information at multiple different levels. We, we're seeing it at the molecular level, the genetic level, we have pathology, we have radiology, we have the EHR, right? Um, increasingly, we have behavioral information, and this is drawn from things like mHealth and other sorts of but other areas. And then obviously we have epidemiological information. All of this is actually used in some ways by a physician to make a diagnosis or to, to understand how to treat an individual. And we actually have to draw upon this sort of multi-scale perspective also when we have um, uh, AI sort of methods looking at healthcare. Often, however, what we've been developing is actually very silo. We actually develop techniques singularly in terms of, oh, I've got an algorithm for AI in terms of being able to read a CT image, whereas I have another algorithm for histopathology. So increasingly what you're seeing is this interest in multimodal approaches to actually bring all of this information together. And that obviously creates a very complex space. But the other problem here is that we also have to consider time. As patients actually present, um, patients are not just singular observations point in time, right? Their disease is actually a trajectory. And so what this uh, slide is showing you is that often we actually have no, um, the, the trajectory of an individual and their disease is actually um, varies over time. And what information we might actually get from the clinical or uh, perspective or from an EHR is actually somewhat biased, if you will. Um, you can imagine that the patient starts with no disease, right? And so obviously we're not necessarily going to collect a lot of data on them. We might have things like um, mHealth data on them if they're providing that, but largely we might only see that patient annually for a physical checkup. As we may do some screening, we may detect someone's at high risk for something, so we're actually going to increase the frequency of that data collection for that particular thing. But the patient may still be asymptomatic, right? They may not actually be presenting any symptoms, so we're not actually worried about it. Um, and that disease may progress, it may become an indolent disease, right? So um, the disease may, may start off slowly um, and we may measure some of that disease. So a good example of this is where a patient might, for instance, develop um, prediabetes. We're, we're concerned about their diabetes or the, they're ultimately proceeding to type two diabetes, whereas uh, we may think, okay, well, they're, they're HbA1c values are, are rising, and so we have indolent disease there, right? So we're going to increase the, the frequency of monitoring up to the point where then the patient actually then develops the disease if we haven't prevented it. Um, at that point, then obviously we increase the monitoring, right? We're going to have much more frequent uh, lab assays or, or imaging or other types of things, and we're going to be treating that individual then. Um, in some cases, the disease resolves. In other cases, it becomes chronic. But it, at some point, we then begin to look at the long-term outcomes for this individual. So if you think about the trajectory in this case and how we're collecting the data, um, the amount of information that we have at any given time is going to vary. Now, the other challenge, of course, is that when we look at the electronic health record and sort of these, these data sets that are accrued, we really don't know where every single patient starts with respect to the disease, right? The observations that we have are not all starting from the same point. A patient may come in late. For instance, we may actually only see the patient as they begin um, with the disease, right? Whereas in some cases, if we have longitudinal data, we may have observed some things early on, but that, that individual uh, may be very different in how fast they proceed in terms of disease. All of these things sort of come into play when we're actually trying to look and mine um, the electronic health record. So this really goes to the point which an individual's disease risk changes over time and we really have to consider the trajectory findings. So how does this all sort of come back to AI? So I'll give you two examples of, of projects that I've worked on um, and continue to work on. One is in lung cancer and the, one, the other one is in chronic kidney disease. Uh, so for some context, lung cancer, um, still the single largest cause of cancer-related mortality in the U.S. and worldwide, right? Um, it's responsible for more deaths um, than colon, breast, and prostate cancer uh, deaths combined. So that's actually a really significant number. Now, while the, the prevalence of lung cancer is slowly going down because uh, the amount of, of, for instance, smoking and things like that have, have um, decreased, um, it's still a problem. 
And what we do know about lung cancer is the earlier you detect it, the better you'll do, right? If we can detect the cancer early, we can actually resolve it. Um, and you have a much higher uh, five-year survival rate than if we detect it late. And so this really prompted um, investigation into can we use lung cancer, can, can we use imaging to do a better job at detection? Uh, some of you may know about the National Lung Screening Trial, the NLST, and this, this, the results of the NLST, I think, came out in 2012, 2013, which did reveal that um, low-dose uh, computer tomography um, did decrease the mortality rate for, for individuals. And this prompted then the development of um, uh, screening programs across the U.S., okay? Now, the problem, however, was that the NLST, despite it, it, uh, the, the, the ability to decrease mortality rates, um, found two things. One is it had a very high false positive rate. Low-dose CT um, in the NLST had about 20% false positive. This is a pretty high number when you think about it, right? Um, so that means we're actually sending people to, to for instance, biopsies, um, and sort of more aggressive sort of diagnoses when we don't need to. Um, and obviously there's a lot of both, both um, economic as well as psychological harm that can, can arise from that. Um, the second thing which is also related is concerns about overdiagnosis. So just because we find something suspicious on a low dose CT imaging um, doesn't necessarily mean it will require intervention. So there's this concern that we may be over diagnosing individuals that really, if we had left it alone or if we leave it alone, nothing bad will happen to the individual. So this prompted us to sort of ask the question, can we learn from the data using longitudinal observations of a given person to decrease the false positives in lung cancer screening? Um, and more specifically, given a new low dose CT observation, can we recommend a biopsy or continued screening, right? Does the individual just need to be screened and, and we don't need to intervene, or do we actually need to go to a more aggressive diagnostic um, procedure in order to make a confirmation of whether the patient has um, the uh, cancer or not? So we actually pose this question in terms of reinforcement learning and sequential decision making. What happens is uh, a patient is seen uh, a high risk, low dose, high risk lung cancer a high risk patient for lung cancer um, is usually screened every year. So they'll be, uh, they'll re receive a low dose CT imaging study. And at that point, what you wanna do is, is the radiologist will make a decision. Okay, we think you're at high risk. So we're going to change the frequency of um, the, the imaging studies from, for instance, one year to either three or six months. Um, if they think that a finding is significant, they will send the individual for a biopsy which is obviously an invasive procedure. Um, and you can think about this in terms of, in terms of sequential decision-making, as I accrue information and observations over time for this individual, um, what is the risk of this individual um, and for this individual and what is the appropriate action I should be taking? Okay, so we created a partially observable Markov decision process or upon DP for this um, in order to determine an optimal sequence of screening actions for individuals. We use the NLST data. Uh, we developed a range of AI based, or we used a range of um, AI based methods in order to develop the models. Specifically, we, we used a dynamic belief network for DBN to estimate the probability of a cancer um, at a given point in time. And then we used uh, reinforcement learning, so actually, specifically inverse reinforcement learning, to establish a reward function for the PON DP that would mimic the expert's actions. So, again, the goal here was could we actually at least emulate what the radiologists were doing in the LST? And so obviously with the PONDP, we have these sort of three states. One is no cancer, um, another one is invasive cancer, and the other one was sort of uncertain, right? And this is sort of your, your state space. And what we found was that the PONDP performance was actually equal to the experts, and in some cases recommended earlier diagnostic action before the expert. In this particular case, what that meant was we were able to determine that there was a potential, there was a cancer earlier than the radiologist, right? So we used the Stanford infold cross validation and that. The challenge of this was we had only done internal validation in LST data set. So we're actually in the process right now doing this uh, with uh, external data sets to the NLST. However, what we also found was, although we improved performance 
um, somewhat over the experts using these techniques, the false positive rate, which we were really targeting, did not significantly decrease, except in certain cases. We had um, certain clear nodules, for instance, on the imaging studies that um, were, were larger, and we, we were able to, to detect that. But we really didn't solve the false positive rate, which is what we were really hoping to be able to do. And what we realized was the POMDP itself was optimized for earlier detection over time, but it wasn't really targeting the decreasing, uh, but not for decreased false positives. So we actually added a classifier on top of this POMDP. And what we found is when we did that, we were actually able to, um, we just trained a random forest that actually, oh, we've explored a couple different models, but it turned out the random forest was, was the simplest. What we were actually able to find was we can actually achieve better performance um, maintaining um, the, the overall detection, if you will, for um, the POMDP relative to the radiologists um, while decreasing the false positive. So these numbers are actually a little bit out of date. If you look at the, the table in blue in the bottom right, um, the false negative rate that we actually have there has actually been reduced down to one. Um, and you can see that the false positive rate has decreased quite significantly over time. Okay. Second example I'll sort of give you in terms of applications of AI in terms of uh, for, for healthcare is, is in the chronic kidney disease space. So um, CKD um, is the ninth leading cause of mortality in the US. Um, and the question was, was posed to us, can we detect it um, early and can we actually prevent it? So um, this problem was sort of identified quite early on by, by our UCLA health system. And what they made, um, a promise to us was that if we could come up with a solution, they would actually implement it um, within the healthcare system. So they would actually translate it into practice, um, which is great because we certainly didn't want to just create a paper and publish it without actually showing the impact um, and actually having an effect patient care. Uh, what we've done is we have actually created this large scale EHR based data set, more than 6 million patients. Um, and what this really has let us do is uh, a, a few things. One is it forced us to actually deal with the problem of um, missing data. So again, for those of you who've ever dealt with clinical data, um, if you've ever looked, for instance, at the MIMIC data set or any of the other sort of data sets out there that, that are drawn from electronic health records, you know that the data is sparse and often um, there's challenges there. So that allowed us to actually begin to look for novel methods for handling data imputation particularly as we look at it over time. Um, the second thing that this allowed us to do is examine the problems of the contemporary um, deep learning architecture. So a lot of things like RNNs and um, CNNs make certain assumptions about the data set. And it turns out that particularly some of the representational issues that you have with deep learning and, and so forth um, don't actually hold up when we're dealing with real world clinical data. And so this is actually letting us sort of develop these new um, temporal modeling methods um, based on this data sets to look at chronic kidney disease um, and look at multi-agent reinforcement learning with the clinical data sets. So the reason why I wanted to highlight this particular project was it turns out that from dealing with the clinical health data, um, particularly in a real world setting, we're actually able to drive a lot of new computational methods uh, and sort of develop the algorithms and, and techniques. So it's not simply just a reapplication of existing methods, um, but sort of motivating and, and innovating within the computational space. And this has actually been a really um, exciting project for us to be able to, to develop these new techniques and then actually see them actually go back into healthcare. Okay, so all of that being said, um, this is a slide I often use with, with my students. Um, and the, the point here is that there are a lot of challenges, certainly with AI and data science, and these are sort of the nine um, things I, I often have them think about. Um, and it's really sort of developed over time based on the two projects that I just cited as well, some of the um, earlier work we've done in this space. But it's really about three things, which is knowing your data, uh, knowing your goal, and knowing your usage. And so it, it's, it, some of these might be antithetical, particularly to, to um, my colleagues in, in, in informatics. Um, but a lot of these points are, are sort of intended to drive home the point that, that AI in healthcare is challenging and we can't just sort of make certain assumptions about um, the data and how, how the models themselves will be used. So I'll take you through a couple examples um, 
I won't go through all of them, obviously, in the interest of time. Um, but one example is, is this belief that more data is better, right? And in AI and healthcare, that's particularly not true. Um, not all data is equal, particularly given changes in practice over time. So what you're seeing here are two examples. And this is a bit of an extreme example, but you, these are MR images of the brain. Uh, what you see in the middle in 1984 was an image of the brain. This was the best that they could do. Okay, And you can sort of see, um, uh, I've drawn a box, a black box around a certain region. If you compare that to what we can do in 2015, with the seven Tesla MR image, obviously there's a huge difference in the imaging quality, right? Um, so one challenge, for instance, as we compile these data sets, and if you look across different data sets that are publicly available, particularly in radiologic imaging, the changes in imaging um, technology have to be taken into account. So it's not simply that uh, we have different MR scanners or different CT scanners, the actual capacity and ability to, to create better images obviously will fundamentally change um, the, the, what, what an algorithm might learn from, right? So if you give, if given that, you sort of have to take that into consideration. Is a 10-year archive of imaging necessarily use, all usable? And the answer might be yes, depending on the type of imaging. But if you blindly sort of assume that all the data there is equal, uh, you, you'll run into trouble. And some of you might recognize Michael Jordan from this, um, this image. Um, and he wrote this, this article in 2018, um, Artificial Intelligence, the Revolution Hasn't Happened Yet. And this sort of actually goes directly to that imaging example, right, where um, he was talking about how he and his wife um, were, were having a child. And um, they were told initially that the child looks like may have Down syndrome. And so he was writing about this and he sort of, um, there, there are two points that are highlighted in color here. Um, what had happened was he had discovered that a statistical analysis had been done a decade previously in the UK. Um, and these white spots that were being shown on, um, I think it was an ultrasound or something like that, um, had indicated that if there are white spots present, then, then the child likely has Down syndrome. Um, but then he noticed, as, as shown in the blue, um, that the imaging machine used in the test had been a few more hundred more pixels per square inch than the machine used in the UK study, right? Um, and it turns out that effectively it was that those white spots, and particularly in this case, were false positives. And she's, her, the, the, the doctor's comment was, ah, that explains why we started seeing an uptick in Down syndrome diagnoses a few years ago. It's when the new machine arrived. So this is pretty telling. If we don't actually understand the data um, and contextualize it correctly as to how it was generated, we run into these types of problems. And um, we've seen this happen with machine learning in different, in different areas. It's particularly acute in healthcare because the data changes so quickly. Another sort of challenge that we sort of see is um, in, in healthcare, um, and, and the applications of data-driven methods is the idea of replication versus reproducibility. And what, we've, what has um, happened is that people are focusing more on replication than the idea of reproducibility, which is a problem. Um, replication is easy, right? You can give me your, um, your Docker container with, with your code and, and even your data, and I can rerun that. Um, that's replication. The reproducibility problem is a little more sophisticated and nuanced. And what we're seeing is an approach where everyone's sort of saying, well, we need to get to replication. We need to be able to get to scientific reproducibility so we can build on each other's models and, and be able to share things and, and gain insight. This has led to a proliferation of checklists. Um, for those of you in the ML space, you probably um, are tired of all the checklists that you probably have heard about. Um, within healthcare, we have at least four, and I think the last survey we did was up to about eight um, that different publishers were actually using. Um, but the problem with those checklists is twofold. One is uh, the checklists are more about replication, and the checklists are often um, not necessarily getting to the full level of detail that is needed for reproducibility. The checklists are made easy because we try and simplify it so no one is overburdened with respect to being able to complete the checklist. Um, but at the end of the day, what we want is to be able to do scientific reproducibility. And that really entails 
um, sort of the, the full range of metadata that is in, that is involved in the AI sort of pipeline, right? From the data wrangling and pre-processing that goes on through the model um, assumptions and construction to its evaluation and subsequent deployment. A lot of that information is never captured. It's not actually documented anywhere. It's sort of um, assumed, if you will, that, that that information does exist and that could be shared, but it really needs a more formal strategy. Okay, so in terms of thinking about what, where the opportunities to translate AI into healthcare practice. So this is something um, that I also use with my students, which is sort of dividing up the process into six parts. Um, obviously, there's a problem for formulation. Any sort of AI problem starts with, with good definitions and targeted outcomes. Um, but I think that, that in terms of the computational space, there's a lot of different components in terms of model building, model testing, model evaluation, implementation, and continuous monitoring, um, where I think there's a lot of space to innovate in terms of the technology and particularly the computational methods. Um, in terms of model building, obviously, um, the development and annotation of these data sets uh, is, is critical. Um, but I think one of the biggest questions out there is how do you choose the appropriate model for the problem? And there hasn't been a lot of work in this. Um, for those of you who um, are familiar with the NIH from the National Institutes of Health, there's a lot of work right now in, in um, or there will be, soon to be announced with the Bridge to AI program. and um, that program is, is being launched um, imminently. But there will be a lot of good data sets out there, and I think there will be opportunities from those data sets then to actually begin to explore, um, are there ways that we can think about how to build models more effectively and select those models um, appropriately? And I think the other point I'll make here is that um, it's not simply just about innovating on the right model, but also combining different types of models, not necessarily on an ensemble technique, um, but recognizing that there's opportunities to combine different strategies to solve a problem. Um, in terms of model, model testing, in terms of the technical aspect, I think it's also an open-ended question as to how do we effectively evaluate different models? Um, there's always sort of from the, the statistical perspective, the question of internal and external validity, um, but I think what we also wanna get to is a question of robustness and transportability, right? Um, in terms of model evaluation, in looking at the real world, obviously we have parameter tuning questions, um, but now we have to also deal with non-curated observational data. And I think this is also sort of um, a telling point, which is a lot of um, AI techniques to date, with perhaps the exception of things like the MIMIC data set and, and some other things, they actually are being built on curated data sets. Um, even the bridge to AI data sets that, that will be um, coming forth may be curated to some extent. The question I think though is if you go from a curated data set or if you go from, for instance, a data set that came from a, controlled uh, a randomized controlled trial, those data sets are not necessarily what you would expect in the real world. Um, so how do you handle that? And, and I think there's, there's questions there as well. Um, in terms of implementation, this is more um, about ensuring that the models are usable um, and even explainable, right? So I think the question here is, with all the work that's being done in AI, obviously in healthcare, there's concern that we may not understand um, what is actually going on. And I think that this actually lends itself to um, some, some deeper discussions about the, the utility of AI in healthcare and how we can actually make it useful. And I think finally, um, the question goes to how do you operationalize AI? And that's, that's sort of the continuous monitoring. Um, we will have data set shift, right? So how do we actually detect that in a meaningful way? How do we know when we need to retrain these models? Um, how do we account for things like changes in practice or technology? All of these questions are sort of um, ongoing. And I think there's, again, opportunity from the computational perspective to, to address these. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna just um, add one, one additional thing here, which is um, for, for those of you who are interested in the healthcare space um, and who have been doing work in the space, I wanted to uh, let you know about um, a new annual data science work um, that is looking at data science in healthcare. Um, there, it's in, through the Hearst Health um, 
group, and they actually partnered with us at UCLA to do this. There's a national judging panel um, that is being formulated. Um, more information about this award will be forthcoming. You can see the link at the very bottom there. Um, and the top prize for these awards, um, which are should be running for five years starting this year, um, is 100,000. Um, and there's two additional awards. I don't quite recall off the top of my head how much money those additional awards might be. But for those of you, again, who are in sort of the AI space um, and dealing with healthcare um, or know others, please let them know about this. So I'll end on a joke um, just to give you some food for thought. And for those of you who um, might know this joke, um, there's an old joke about pilots in the future plane cockpit. For those of you who don't know about it, the joke goes like this. Someone walks into a new fully automated plane and asks, why is there a dog and a pilot in the cockpit? And another passenger answers, well, the pilot is there to feed the dog. First person's like, say, okay, but why is the dog there? And remember, this is supposed to be fully automated. The dog's there to bite the pilot if he touches anything. So Scott Adams and Dilbert, of course, in, in, in a few years ago when Watson was coming out in healthcare had this point, which is just exactly that. Um, so with that, I will stop here and I will be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Alex, for this very uh, impressive talk and uh, especially you covered a lot of uh, research problems that we, we, we care more uh, a lot about in this area. So uh, before any, any question from, from the audience, I, I do have a question because uh, recently we are, we are studying, uh, I understand that in, in, in healthcare, uh, privacy is a very critical issue. And sometimes we, we train models using the data. Uh, it's very likely that uh, the hospital may not really relieve all the information to us to train the data. So I think there are different solutions. One solution could be we go to a third party, trusted third party, but definitely, definitely that decreases the scalability of the solution, especially in a, if we want to change the model part or if we want to change some details or hyperparameters of, of the model, then that will, you know, face uh, will a lot longer turn around. The other way around is we are currently thinking about what if the data itself can be encrypted, but we can sort of train a model which is invariant to the encryption. So that means that training data can be uh, encrypted and uh, sent to us. But if the model, let's say if the pre-trained language model, let's say if we're, we're processing text data, if they are able to uh, be invariant uh, with, about any such encryption operation, then that could essentially let us see more data which are just encrypted, encrypted. Do you think this is actually a you know, favored way, it's going to be a favored way in, in your area? So I think there's two or three approaches that I've been seeing. Um, I don't know which one is going to win out. <laughs> um, obviously the, the most common approach that people have been using is sort of the distributed technique, right? Send the model around um, to the different sites to train oh, yeah. it iterative like do, do an iterative cycles of, of refinement um, that's one way I think the challenge with that and, and, and with some of the other techniques that we've seen in this space um, for for broader model development um, have been whether the model itself is actually um, capturing some of the information in in itself and therefore it's it's even if you share the model you're still sharing some particular data that might be sensitive um, so I think there's that problem. I think that the second um, situation, which or second scenario that you've described is in terms of the encryption, right? Yep. Uh, which I think is actually a really promising technique in terms of, particularly if, if it's sort of this one-way encryption type of, of framework. Um, so I think that there is a huge amount of work that's being done both, I mean, not just in the healthcare space, but in terms of more generally with the encryption um, and, and sort of the, the um, ML and, or any sort of data-driven analysis techniques. I think that will, that will prove useful. I think the challenge will be um, in healthcare, I think it, the problem will be solved downstream in terms of, of who holds the encryption and all of that. 
but in terms of research, I think that probably is, is um, one of the more compelling sort of strategies right now. Um, I think the third one that, that you are going to see is um, sort of a switch to how much data do you, well, not how much data, what data do you need to learn and how much of it can actually be um, made not sensitive, right? How much of it can you obscure or obfuscate without impacting necessarily the underlying um, data distributions or anything like that. So I think there's that sort of been a, the, the, obviously there's been a huge amount of work on the statistical side with, with sort of um, your classic sort of, of, of numerical data, but I think that will be slowly translated moving forward um, into um, this, the, this space. Now, in, in relation to that third one, and, and this is sort of a, an open-ended question, which, which also gets to some of the other issues, um, people have been using GANs, right, um, in order to develop these synthetic data sets. So the big problem there, or the big question there is, well, there, there are two questions. One is, are the GANs actually developing um, appropriate represent distributions that actually are useful in healthcare. And the reason why we say that or, or questioning that is often medicine is about the outliers, right? It's usually the tails that are problematic and not the average. And if the GANs are only learning the average or the, the easy part, then we may at be actually excluding the problematic parts. That's one part. Um, the second question is whether, um, and they are fully representative. And I think um, there's been broad interest, um, particularly, and I didn't touch upon it in this talk, about the ethical components of, of the usage of synthetic data sets, right? If the data set itself is not necessarily um, representative to begin with, and you have a GAN sort of generate this, then from, from that, right, you've learned a GAN um, that does this, then you, you also run into some potential issues. Okay, I see a question from Yolanda. Hi, yes, thank you. What a wonderful and exciting and visionary talk. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm wondering, uh, you know, throughout your talk, you talk about precision medicine, but I have a lot of trouble seeing some of the work as precision medicine as opposed to you know, just medicine in general. And of course, there's more and more types of data. There's more and more interest in integrating those types of data. It seems that that's medicine. Is there something specific to precision medicine? So I can imagine that maybe individuals that are more, that have more common traits used as a seed for learning, and then that might be uh, you know, transfer to other populations with special techniques? Is it that, you know, um, you have better chance to uh, do precision medicine if you just learn through specific groups of populations, you know, directly and from the start? And if so, what defines a group or a population? So I guess I didn't see that part in your, in your talk. Um, so I, I wanted you to speak to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you two answers to that. One is, um, and, and this is a, a very high level perspective, um, a lot of the AI techniques right now are, are being used to do better stratification. And at the end of the day, the question is, um, you could, instead of going from one group, okay, well, you stratify to five groups. That's, that's still not precision medicine in my mind. The question is, can you use the AI techniques obviously to get to a stratification of one, right? So start from the general population and refine the model to actually get to the individual. And so the, the way that I sort of see these techniques for, um, combining together is um, often we don't necessarily know enough about the individual, but once we accrue enough observations over time, we should be able to go from a general model and actually retune the model to actually be able to be tailored to the individual, right? So you can, you might imagine, and we're doing this in some some um, health studies, right? That that we're 
um, conducting right now, which is start with the general population model, because again, you don't necessarily know where the patient may lie in that distribution. Um, and we accrue observations over time from the individual, from the smartphone or, or from their smartwatch, and we tune the model as we, as we get more input from the individual. So we can then do better prediction over time, right? So then you're beginning to get to that more precise um, tailoring of the recommendations that you might do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So, so that's sort of the, 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 the first answer I'll give you. I think the second answer um, is, is not simply just about the models, but also the, um, the selection of what are the observations that we need to be making about different individuals over time. And again, I sort of use time as the, the challenging point here because a lot of the work that's, that's being done right now is sort of static in perspective, right? We have one, one observation and maybe we have an outcome for, for the patient. Um, but I think that if we begin to tailor, again, um, or, adjust, or adjust things in terms of what are the interventions, right? The, the observations and the interventions in that cycle, then I think we do get to more precise healthcare. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, uh, Yolanda and uh, Alex. So, any other questions from the audience? If there's no other questions, I can ask um, <laughs> something else if that's okay. So, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I think some of the discussion that you had about uh, the, the continuous monitoring and the data set shifts and so on, um, mm -hmm. are, are the data sets shifting because the instruments change? Or do you see the diseases or the population due to environmental factors or you know, other factors? really doing a, a data set shift or is it just the instruments? It's both or all of those, right? And I guess the question, the, the challenge is we may know um, that there's a new instrument, right? That or a new metric or a new, new, new tool that's being used. Um, and so that is a confounder, if you will, that we can adjust for or we can incorporate into our analysis. It's when we don't have when, when there are external confounders like environment, or for instance, there might be a policy change, right? Or a new drug is, is introduced. That is not necessarily as obvious. And those type of influences over the data are, are um, need to be thought about, right? Um, and, and so I think those, there's a lot of these different things that influence the data, particularly in the clinical setting that, that um, most people don't think about um and and those again it's because medicine changes so rapidly right okay. oh someone else unmuted okay <laughs> if i if i can uh, jump in with a question so first of all thanks for the talk it was very interesting uh, i think a very good overview of the possibilities and challenges I want to focus on the imaging that you spoke a little bit about the MRI example, for instance, yeah. with the 7T. And in spite of having 7T MRIs, most AI systems eventually downsample that to 244 by 244 pixels, and perhaps using convolutions that were trained on recognizing stop signs as opposed to the fuzzier medical images. Uh, do you think there's an opportunity for doing imaging specific to medicine as opposed to taking what we've learned from natural images and uh, applying it to medicine? I do think that there is, um, particularly in, in imaging, uh, medical imaging. I think the challenge that I've always seen is people are sort of taking your standard UNETs or, or BGT nets or choose your favorite natural naturally trained um, model, if you, like deep, deep, deep network model for these from the natural environments and then applying it to, to medicine. And there is some, a little bit of utility there, right? Because obviously we are seeing, are seeing some results, but it's usually more about things like edge detection and so forth. But the problem that um, I, I know some of my colleagues feel 
about this is that medical imaging is not is, is actually a bit of a proxy, right? It's not an actual photo. And so when you have natural lighting and things like that in, in natural imaging, and you're learning from natural imaging, the perspective there is very different. And so this is why we have radiologists and they, they actually train for several years, right? It's a very different conceptualization. Um, so I do think there is an opportunity specifically to medical imaging. And, and again, people try to, to um, apply these, these deep learning architectures, um, particularly in that space. Now, where again, I think the problem lies is that the deep learning architectures themselves and imaging are only sort of learning these low level details, right? The layers that, that we see in those networks are um, obviously as, you, as the networks sort of grow, you get to, to higher level concepts. But those concepts are not necessarily related to um, what a radiologist or physician is thinking, right? We haven't made that connection quite yet. And so what, what I've actually challenged some of my colleagues to look at is what if you think about the lower level layers in those deep learning architectures, they are pulling out features. They're obviously learning something. But at the end of the day, you probably want a symbolic representation that's associated or a conceptual representation. There's a, um, I'm going to get the phrasing wrong. I think they call it neurosymbolic um, computation, where basically you have the, the lower level details linked to a higher level concept, right? And you do reasoning on the higher level concepts, but, you, but it's sort of that, that abstraction layer. So I, did, I definitely think that's necessary for medical imaging, at least in the radiologic and um, digital pathology spaces. Uh, so thanks, I, I do uh, agree with you uh, quite a bit on that. Um, I'm a little bit worried because as we do bridge to AI and collect data, that data is not necessarily being annotated with some of those semantic concepts. So when, you know, ground glass opacities and things of that sort that you see in radiology. Uh, so um, I, I'm hoping we can convince some um, in the, uh, th there are new AI techniques that could take advantage of that if the data were annotated. Correct. And, and we're still not quite sure from Bridge to AI what the actual data sets will be um, or what the projects will be. I, 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 I know that the announcements are going to be coming out in the next six weeks, I believe, um, with respect to the, the groups and, and, and involvement there. Um, I think one of the challenges or opportunities, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, um, is to challenge these groups to actually provide those annotation tools, right? Um, my understanding from NIH and speaking with them about Bridge to AI is that the intent is not necessarily to create perfect data sets, but to actually get to the tools that will facilitate future annotation. Um, and I think the other sort of commentary I've heard from Bitch, Bitch to AI personnel from NIH is they also know that these data sets are not going to be long lasting, right? Because, okay. Because it, these are intended to um, be, if, if, if the data set is being used for more than 10 years, for instance, from their perspective, it's wrong, right? The technology will have changed the capacity will have changed. And so they shouldn't be using it for that long, but at least in the short term, that this isn't meant to be a catalyst for the process. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Alex. And uh, yeah, uh, actually I have more questions, but I understand that you need to have a hard stop at, at 12. So we are at 12 already. So yes, but, but hope to have more follow-up questions with you. Because I'm, I'm also curious about for example, uh, uh, whether uh, machine learning models will face spurious correlation issues in uh, healthcare applications, but hope to discuss with you later. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks once again uh, for this very inspiring and uh, informative talk. Yeah, hope to have more discussions and also collaboration with you. Well, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I, I look forward to talking with more of you later. Thanks again. Have thanks. a good weekend. Yeah, you too. Bye.